So I'm Ted Dunning. I'm Chief Application Architect for MapR, here to talk about what really matters. Now, this is often in contrast in an academic setting, what matters, what doesn't. But what I'm going to speak from here as a reformed academic is what matters industrially. And uh, let's, let's talk just a moment about some of the things that our customers have done. So for instance, breaking the minute sort record on 300 nodes. How does that happen? Is that important or not? Uh, here's something a bit more, recommending a lot of music to customers. <coughs> Over 100,000 recommendations per minute. Running the largest advertising uh, exchange on the web. How do they do that? What algorithms do they do? Curing cancer, well, not quite done yet, but uh, in progress. Uh, MD Anderson is working very hard on genetic studies to guide treatment. That's another hard problem, but there are some interesting algorithms that are very pragmatically useful for that, or helping to uh, make the latent economy in India work. There's no universally recognized identifier in India, which means that a very large fraction of the population can't participate in an economy. How in the world do you identify them reliably? So on. So those are some of the things that we want to do or we are doing with large data systems. But then the question comes, how is it done and, and what sort of things aspirationally should we do and adopt to make these things more plausible? What's important, what's not? Those are the key questions for today. So to me, what's important to an algorithm and this is kind of an upside down list. Most people start talking about accuracy, they talk about speed and things like that. I first talk about, is it deployable? Can you make that system come into being, actually reliably deploy it? Can you deploy an update to it? Is it robust? Uh, robust in particular to uh, misconfiguration, because of course somebody will mishandle your algorithms. They won't be operated correctly all the time. Will the system continue to work? And will it tell you that something bad is happening? When you sit down to make an algorithm and invent something, you need one kind of person, an inventive kind of person. When you sit down to operate it, you need a diametrically opposed personality. You need a person who's very reliable at getting things done and making sure that they happen exactly the same way each day. These are not superior or inferior types of people, regardless of my own prejudices about that. But, uh, but they are very different. The things that I can do as kind of an inventor sort of person are very different from the sorts of person who's very reliable. Because they're very reliable, they don't like uncertainty, they don't like experimentation, they don't like trying new things necessarily. They like things that work. I hate that, that's so boring. And I cannot do their job because I like making a list, a to-do list, and then picking which 10% I'll do. This is exactly what they don't do. They make a list and they guarantee they will do every item on the list. So you have to be able to invent something that's inventable, but then you need to transfer it to the other mindset, the reliable mindset, and that really limits the algorithms that you can talk about and, talk and use. And then also there's this proportionality problem most of us do not have a data science team the size of Google's. And even they have to make trade-offs about which things are worth working on right now. All of the teams that I've worked on in my professional career, six or so startups, have had tiny teams. And even when we had a big team, we divided it into small teams because they are so much more efficient at building new things. And that's what a startup is, is a new thing. So typically we have five to 12 people on a team and out of that group you can't devote 30 people to data science. You all have to do a little bit of data science and you have to decide for each minute that you impose yourself some task, how much benefit will there be? And how much benefit will there be if you spend five months trying to invent something new, trying out a new academic algorithm, versus trying something that's very much more reliable and easier to deploy. So these are not the 
important list that you would see at any university because these are not what's important in an academic sense. They're innovation. Has anybody else done this before? That's important. They're difficult is important because if it's too easy, it's not worth talking about. And so this is the list I work for them when I say which algorithms are really important. And that's a very different kind of list. Uh, reproducibility, innovation, these are the academic goals and they're just a different world entirely. So let's take some examples. I'm gonna give you four examples from my own experience where I've done both the academic side and the pragmatic side and come down very firmly on some controversial answers. So for instance, in recommendations, what's the most significant algorithmic improvement over the last 10 years? Notice I picked 10 years because recommendations was basically invented 15 years ago. That was probably the biggest advance is to, the idea to do it. But in the last 10 years, what is the most important algorithmic advances? Anybody got an idea? We could talk about matrix factorizations or co-occurrence like the little tiny book I'm giving away at the booth downstairs. Other kinds of combining things. Uh, anybody here run a recommendation engine? Yeah, what, what kind do you use? So vector-based, is that, do you think, the most important algorithm in the last 10 years? Yeah? Well, here's a, a contrarian point of view. I think adding random numbers to your results, destroying them to some degree, and just not repeating yourself. In my experience, those are the most important things that I've seen in the people I've helped build recommenders. Just adding random noise to it was more important than making the algorithm really good. That's bizarre. The reason is that the real issues in making an algorithm like a recommender work is recognizing that there's a big circle. The recommendations you make today become the training data tonight and therefore the recommender tomorrow. If you don't add good exploration to your system, it does what it knows today. It learns about that, but it already knows it. And so tomorrow it does the same thing. But if you add some noise in there, you add exploration, it reaches a little bit deeper and it finds things at the edge of what it knows. And so what it does today, which looks a little bit worse than it could be, provides a more variety in the training data so that tomorrow it does better because it's learned something new. Now, how big a difference? Differences in algorithms one to another, ALS or co-occurrence based, they typically make a few percent difference going from the best to the worst. If you look at the, uh, the Netflix challenge, the, the first people out of the gate very quickly exceeded the performance of the production thing. And the final, after a year almost of work and innumerable teams coming together, 300 algorithms in the winter, the difference was a few percent, single digit percentage improvements with a worldwide effort of some of the best people in the world. So there's a measure of how big the algorithmic differences can be, about a 5%, 10%, maybe. Yet adding random numbers, adding diversity to the training data often makes a 100 or 200% improvement in performance. So which do you do? The thing that takes you five minutes to add and triples your performance, or the thing that takes you months to add and gives you 5%. Seems to me an easy answer if you're focused on today's results and something soon. And so dithering reorganizes recommendation results by keeping the top things fairly stable, and deeper you go, the more stirring up it does. It's guaranteed to make performance worse in the short term, and better in the long term. Now, uh, I've over and over heard people say, this makes more difference than anything else they've tried. Tried 15 different sorts of recommenders, bam, this thing made every one of them much, much better. So that's what I would say is an important algorithm there. Something very quick, very simple. I've hidden the uh, slide that talks about the implementation, but it's literally two lines of code and I'll talk about it offline if anybody wants it. 
Here's some examples. With a small parameter for the dithering scale, you can see what each row here is originally a sequence of ordered numbers, and it's been reordered according to dithering. The list is 300 long. I'm only showing the first eight. And you can see that the, the first, the most leftmost number, the number one, appears in the top two, always. So it's never far from the top. But we also see things 24, 17, 19, from relatively deep in the result set that have been dredged up occasionally. Here's the same results with more stirring. Now the top element appears in the top three results, always. And you see very, very deep results like 30 or 40 being dredged up into the top eight. So this is the dithering going on. It's pulling things deep in the result list and allowing broader training. And the reason this works is very simple. If you look at the click-through rate as a function of depth, it declines, typically because the things lower in the list are not as good. And then when you get to the second page, people quit looking. People don't click on the second page. But ironically, with dithering, where the, the, the recommendation page looks different, typically the, each time they come back, you might want to stabilize it with time so it looks the same for 10 or 20 minutes, and then it changes. But if people know that that's changing, they will come back to the same page far more than they will click to the second page. People are strange. But that's OK. I mean, those are the people we have to deal with. And so we have to deal with how they work. So lesson one, exploration is good, especially when it's really cheap to add. That's the first important algorithm. Here's a second one, Bayesian bandits. Now, what this is is a much more involved mathematical way of doing the dithering. What it does is it figures out what it knows. And where it knows the answer, it dithers very little. And where it has some uncertainty about which answers might be there, it dithers quite a lot. Now, the benefits of that are that that takes it from just kind of a turn the knob, whatever type of exploration to a tuned exploration which is right now the best known theoretical algorithm for that. Here it is compared to something called uh, epsilon greedy. And the black thing down is good. It's an academic graph, not a business graph. Uh, and uh, you can see that it's substantially below that. And here's a graph from, from Yahoo on their ad serving engine. What we have is that the lowest graph here, this is accumulated regret. Oops, I lost the build. But anyway, the lowest graph there, the very lowest one, is this Thompson sampling approach. And it's better than any other known thing for a very difficult recommendation problem, which is ad serving. And so this, this trick of using what we know and encoding the uncertainty in results leads to this le level of results. I think that's an important thing. Again, it's very, very simple to implement. Literally only a few lines of code in many systems, some, some systems more than others, but an important result here. By focusing on the results, focusing on what we know, we can get world-shaking results. Uh, Thompson sampling, by the way, is now used by Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and every small ad targeting company that I know because it's so dominant. So adding random numbers, especially refined random numbers, big lesson here. Exploration learning about things, automated exploration is easy to do, really a big lesson. Now here's another one. This is, the example here is, is concrete. And this is an online clustering algorithm. Clustering, traditionally, you have to get your data and you go munch on it many, 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 many times. And then you can get a good clustering out of it. This is online clustering. Every data point that you arrives, you can immediately provide a clustering for all of history even if the data that arrives radically restates your view of what a good clustering is, you can still, as each data point arrives, give a good clustering for all of history with a reasonably bounded amount of memory and a very small amount of work for each data point. This is kind of a stunning thing to take a totally iterative algorithm and turn it into an online, real-time sort of thing. And the way it works, well, this is just the problem. K-means clustering is traditional, what mo many people think of as clustering. 
and it's, it's intended to do a least squares type of approximation. And the basic idea there is that we're going to form a sketch of the data. We're going to look at the data as it comes in, and our task is not to cluster it, but to find a small and high quality sketch of the data. Something that is like the original data, but smaller. Here's a picture. Data. Hands waving. But it's like data, right? And it's got structure. You can see the shape of it. And here's a sketch of the data. Now we only have 20 data points instead of 1,000 or 2,000. But it, it captures the shape, especially if you kind of blur your eyes and imagine that each one of those X's represents kind of a fuzzy thing. Then it captures it quite well. And so that's a, a very tight compression of that data. Doesn't take much room to store the sketch, and yet it represents the, the, the structure of that data. And there's nice provable bounds about how high a quality you can do, but again, an easy algorithm that can have high quality and leaves you with a very robust system because it's online and small. And it also happens to be one of the fastest ways known to cluster because the, the, the cost per data point is very fast because you're doing just approximate matching, not high quality matching. And that lets you then do the high quality clustering only on the, the sketch, which is tiny. And the cost per data point then becomes log log m, which we all pretend is a constant in, in industry. So there you go. It's another cool thing. And the lesson there is you can make big data small. And the big data task then is to produce that aggregate. You can find good one-dimensional sketches that give you quantiles. You can find one or multi-dimensional sketches which give you clustering. But this idea of sketching is an important algorithm. That's the fundamental and deep thing, not just one of these. And then here's one last example, which is one of the stranger ones. And it turns out that you can use different kind of building blocks to build recommenders. Here's the recommendation problem. You've got a history of Alice and Charles. They've looked at things. They've bought things. Bob walks in with an apple. What are you going to recommend? Well, on this voluminous data that we have here with massive sort of st strong statistics, of course, we're going to recommend a puppy. Uh, and in contrast, so, you know, if everybody had gotten a pony, as we see in the logs here, we would be able to include nothing from the fact that somebody wanted a puppy, pony because everybody wants a pony, of course. So the question there is how do we trade off between this ubiquity and this co-occurrence? We process logs. We produce uh, a co-occurrence matrix. There's the co-occurrence matrix. And then we reduce it. This is the co-occurrence approach to recommendations. The reduced co-occurrence matrix is called the indicator matrix, and only the indicators matter. In a particular row, the things that have checks are the things that if they're in the history, that's what we should recommend. The cool thing here, all of this is, hey, you can get the software for free. You can do this. This is what Mahout does. The cool thing is that you can take each row of that indicator matrix and you can put it into a search index. You see that last field in that search index, the indicators field. That contains the indicators for puppy. And so now you can search with behavior, not text. And the cool thing is the search engines have weighting. So rare things get higher weights than common things. And the weightings that those do, even though they were motivated by text, are almost exactly the weightings that we want on a recommender. That means by accident, 40 years of research, academics on how to build rec uh, text retrieval engines, and a dozen years of hardening the Lucene search engine, now come to benefit us when we want to build a, search en or a recommendation engine. And they give us a very, very deployable, very robust sort of thing, which makes it important. And it happens to also work better than more complex recommenders. Especially it works better because we don't have to have just one kind of indicator. We can have an indicator for 
browsed down to see the, re the reviews, an indicator for recommended to their mother, an indicator for bought it. Buying something is sometimes a good indicator, sometimes not. If you bought res razor blades, then the razor blades are indicated. If you already bought a car, then that's not a good indicator for recommending a car. Different behaviors indicate differently. And being able to put multiple indicators into the search engine at the same time and query all of them lets us use whatever behavior is correct in the moment. Now, the cool thing then is a lot of tools just work. Here's a picture of solar running in Lucidworks, kind of a commercial version of solar. And this is difficult to read, but there are indicator artists for music recommendations. And here it is, we're running in a video retrieval where we're looking at two behaviors. Words that people type, not as queries, just as behavior. I type the word music. I type the word typography. I type the word cars, things like that. That's behavior. Videos they watch. Now we can recommend from words they type to videos they watch, not in the same session, but across months even of time. And the real example here is with a query Paco de Lucia against a video set of a million videos that do not include any exactly relevant results. If you do a text search, you get 400 episodes of Spanish daytime television, Hombres de Paco. And you can see two words match the query Paco de Lucia, Paco and de. So therefore, we have a beautiful text match and absolute crap results. Here's the recommendation results. Top hit is classical guitar. Second hit is people doing um, flamenco dance, even though flamenco is never a word in there. But Paco de Lucia was known while he was alive for new flamenco, jazzy forms of flamenco. Flamenco being derived from the Jewish communities in Spain, these people being a Spanish group that does specifically flamenco dancing. It looks like somebody engineered all of the knowledge around these videos. And indeed, our users did. They did engineer that by just watching stuff. Then we get another one very similar to the first hit. We get Van Halen doing a classical guitar riff during a concert. That's a kick-ass result. And then we get a guy in a dorm room trying to imitate Paco de Lucia. These are really awesome. And that's an easy thing to do. You can do other examples. Uh, we built an automated system that magically formed a website, put logos on there. People who click on the logos are, after a number of them do it, we show them the things that people who click on that would like. Self-fulfilling. And so we have this two behaviors, and this website forms itself. So the idea here is that a search engine is just a building block, a really good building block, but you can use it to build larger systems that really are not doing search. And in this case, we had a search engine that did recommendations, but the kind of recommendations were a form of search. So we had recursive search abuse going on there, which makes it almost cool. So how does this apply? You guys can answer that question. What do you want to do? What do you want to do with big data? What do you want to do quickly? How do you want to do it? You can start by trying this. You can grab a search engine, you know, stuff you find around the house, and start building these things. These are easily deployed, easily experimented with. Let's hear more. What do you guys do? Any questions? What, what do you want to do? How would you like to do it? If you don't raise your hand, I'll assign questions. So you, you better start. Good. You saved everybody. I have a question about the uh, big, the notion of big data. So he has a question about the notion of big data. He's come to the right conference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. so I only repeat because they can't hear you. So basically, the uh, big data is, uh, uh, is about looking at all the data, right? And that's how it's usually, uh, let's say, uh, ad advocated that you shouldn't aggregate look at all the data, but if we look at this presentation, it looks like the, uh, the data can be very much condensed. 
So his statement is that big data means you should look at all the data. This is a, a parody of what some people say. Uh, and, and, and yet I'm advocating condensation of data. And he sees a, a contradiction. I don't. And I, I think that big data is about having all the data, interpreting the data late, as late as possible, so that I don't do extra work before I have to. That means I have to keep all the data so that I may at any time restate my interpretation of the data. That means I have to retain it, but doesn't mean I have to look at it every moment of every day. And in fact, it's quite natural that some data is cold, some data is hot, but that doesn't mean we can't store it all and potentially look at it all. And, and you will find many cases where not looking at all the data all the time is a big, big advantage. And there's a contradiction there, too. When people talk about real-time processing, they often say, ooh, that's quite difficult. But if you think about you want to process the last three years of data to come up with some result, the real-time system has three years to do that in. The ad hoc query system has three seconds. I would take three years to do the problem. But then I may do it wrong, so I may have to rebuild that real-time system, look at all the data again, hopefully in three seconds, maybe three hours, and then I work in real-time again, or near real-time. So it's the ability to use all the data, not the obligation, that I think is characterizing big data. And the late interpretation of data, so I don't have to structure it all. Because if I have to structure all the data in the world, then you know, I have to wake up in the morning and go, oh my god, somebody has a dead link on their web page. I have to go fix it. Well, that's not going to happen. And that's big data's world is you cannot go fix all the data. It's too big. Yeah, see, that was not so bad. It was actually fun for him to ask a question. So who's the next? Talk loud. The random noise, yeah. He asks if it's related to local minima and simulated annealing, or if it's just a random ass thing that I came up with because I like random numbers. <laughs> it, in, in some cases, it's all of those. So the local minimum problem is if the, the system has some very hard relationship that it's discovered, perhaps by watching another system, and that's the bootstrap data, then it only learns about what the previous system did. And that's a local minimum sort of thing. And, and because it's only learning about what it already knows, then it never can escape. And then the random numbers smooth the landscape a little bit. And, and you can imagine it's like heat that's knocking things around. So you have Brownian in motion. The, the system trains in a very high dimensional space and wanders. So in that sense, it's the local minimum thing and very closely related to simulated annealing because you may turn down the amount of randomness later if the system seems to be working pretty well and if he that helps. But it is also more than that as well. It is just in any system that must learn and must provide its own training data, you have a choice. And if I have two coins, I'm going to flip them, and you get money every time it comes up heads, but you don't when it comes up tails. You have to pick which one to flip. How do you know? Well, you have to try both, right? So you have to explore, but you want to get the money. You want to win from the best coin, so you have to exploit. And that trade-off is a fundamental one. You have to learn about the world in order to use the world and, and gain from it. But once you know what's best, you have to focus on that to get the benefit. If you continue exploring the whole world, you get no benefit over just totally random action. So you have to trade those off. And that's the real core of this, these random numbers, trading exploration versus exploitation. And I think that's more than the local minimum. Right behind you, yeah. You, you shouldn't be thinking about those 400 episodes. <laughs> it will, it will.
Yes. And I, I appreciate you asking that question. So he points out that if, if we shuffle the 400 results that are all wrong, we learn nothing, unless somehow some guitarist appeared on some episode and it's slightly better. But we're not talking about looking at just the correlation between a query and the results for that query. We are looking over a long time. And we have other sources for people to discover videos. So there might be a here's the new videos sort of thing. People will look at that occasionally and they'll go, oh, that looks good. Or here's the popular videos. They might look at the most popular, most popular within a genre. And so they show tendencies in their behavior. That's one kind of behavior. They show other tendencies in their behavior. So even if they search for pocket Alicia and find nothing, they have exhibited that behavior. So maybe a week later, they do find some classical guitar or a friend sends them uh, the cute Van Halen thing. And now they, we draw the connection statistically in our analysis offline. And that's where the exploration begins to help. Not with the strict textual connection. Searching and trying to improve a single query's results purely based on that data is a dead end, I think. Many people have tried that. It provides very minor results. You might boost one result over another relative to that query. But you're not learning about the world at large. You're just learning about that query. And that query will not come up very often because most queries don't. And so that's too limited. You need to look broader and have exploration means into the system. Yeah. I have another question. Do you have any experience how much uh, correlation there is between the gibbering and the speed of improvement? Because having real users, they don't like the guaranteed gross results. So is it that I can have a very small gibbering and just need a more time to get better results? Or do I have a kind of threshold where if I have too less gibbering, it's worth nothing? Yeah, so he asks what the trade-off between how much dithering and which degrades results quality and how long it takes to learn. This is the crux of the problem. Uh, I'm so glad you asked the question. This is the fundamental question. Now, the Thompson sampling gives you an optimum trade-off if you can apply it. Now, the, there's mathematical requirements to apply it. You have to understand your system in order to encode ignorance. Most, most model systems encode knowledge. A Bayesian system also encodes ignorance. You must be able to do that in order to apply Thompson sampling. But in, in, the, in the absence of that ability, you can still turn to different levels of dithering and you can measure how the system does in an A-B testing sort of thing. And you can tune it to a better or worse sort of thing. And you can do heuristic approximations. My question is, if I may add this, is in a, in a, uh, not in an environment where I have consumers and users, but maybe in an enterprise environment where I have very demanding users, can I tell them, well, I, I make it now a little bit worse. They don't like it. Oh, 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 wait a minute. You, you said the magic words. I tell them I'm going to make it a little bit worse. You I never tell them. I tell my boss. Don't tell him either, unless he's a mathematician. I got the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you tell, tell people them. that you're producing the best results possible for them. The and that involves you learning about their needs. The question is there a threshold? If I do it very, very slow turn, a very immediate turn, will I have uh, uh, improvement at all? Or is there a kind of threshold that I got these deep uh, 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 results? Of yeah, there's, there is, is a threshold below which you learn nothing because the top 10 results are always the top 10 results. And then it's, it's only shuffling the things that nobody ever sees. That is a, a too low threshold. That exists, absolutely. There is too high a, a level as well where the results are just gibberish. You must find a middle ground. And often I just do it by eye because it's not so far off. You just look at it and you nudge it to where, yeah, it looks still pretty good but it's definitely bringing in a lot of new stuff. And in the examples I gave where the number 18 result actually showed up in the top three, that's probably okay. So, especially if your users don't trust you anyway. So you have to change the first page to 
if you don't change the first page, it will go to nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't make it just garbage. Yeah. It has to be somewhere between those two very subtly different <laughs> things. So there must be a certain number of users before it starts to get to There must be a certain number of users. Well, there has to be a certain amount of data. Yeah. Now, users, you can adjust how much data you collect about users. So many people would collect just what they bought. But if you look, think about an Amazon page, the people who scroll down to find the reviews, that's a huge behavior. And it's far more common than purchase. And people put it in a wish list. The best use of a wish list is not because the users ever go remember to look at it again. It is purely because you let them say what they want. And you let them say it in a very selfish way, what they want for themselves, not they would rate it so somebody else would be, you know. That's a very complicated social act. So you can increase the amount of data you have by many orders of magnitude by giving them chances to speak their mind. And you still have a limit, though. If you have three users in an enterprise setting, I mean, sometimes that happens, right? You build... A, you know, or, or, or this tool is just for these three people yeah. and, and so on, then no, not much you can do there. Uh, you may have a very difficult time. You maybe can learn from somebody else's behavior, but not from those three people. But I have seen exactly this technique used very well in a, an enterprise setting where you might have 40 versions of a document, which is the right one for people to look at. Well, the people will tell you, but you cannot tell by looking at the text. They'll tell you by looking at all of them and picking one. And then pretty soon you know. Yeah, there were some other. Oh, there, there's lots more. A guy in a red shirt. I mean, a cousin. So you, you use a few terms. He asks, uh, is it okay to just not clean up your data and pretend that that's the same as dithering? I'm making up the way you said it. I'm saying it in a more extreme form. Uh, or, or could you just use that that way? Do you really need to clean the data still? Well, bots, you know, if you leave bots in, you learn about bots. And if bots pay the bills, okay. But if you're trying to satisfy non-bots, and you can't satisfy the bot anyway, then leaving their data in there is not helpful. Now, often it's very easy to clean those out. And, and that is inherent in the co-occurrence counting. One of the first steps as you look, you've got users in rows and things in columns. One of the first things you do is you look at how many things a particular user did. You do that first because the co-occurrence counting is proportional to the square of the number of non-zeros in each row. Anything with more than 1,000 actions, eh, you probably don't really need to keep all 100,000 actions. Uh, and that makes a big difference to the running time. And if you think about it, if I ask you, what are the last 1,000 songs you listened to? <coughs> Will I understand his music? I think so. I mean, probably the last 10, I would know a lot. Certainly, I could downsample it to the last 1,000, and it would be no loss. And if you find somebody who's listened to 200,000 unique songs, they probably are a spider or a QA department. They're crazy. I mean, they, 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 they get this way. Uh, and so down sampling them, that's no problem. Or if you have some item which everybody listens to, well, that's going to co-occur with everything. And you probably aren't going to learn that much about more than 1,000 users who listened to it or watched it. It's probably the introductory welcome to Yahoo or welcome to VO or whatever video that everybody has to watch or the ad that everybody gets shown. You know, so downsampling those are fine. Those are ways of cleaning the data automatically without really knowing, just knowing that those aren't the people you're trying to serve. So cleaning it in that sense is very important. That is not the kind of noise we want. We want 
noise that explores within the things we are after trying to solve. There was somebody else. Well, ah, oh, no, let's get, let the guy in green. We have to go from one primary color to another. What? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also cyan, so you know we're in RGB space. Absolutely. He asks if it's good to add more noise to some products where we have less information and less noise to things that are more mature and precisely. Absolutely. That's the essence of Thompson sampling is that we can add more noise in places where we know less and less noise where we know more. I'm so amazed I got that straight. Uh, that was not normal. <laughs> I would get that backwards with the slip of a hat. But yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And that's, that's the essence of what Thompson did in, in the 30s, is he realized that that was true. The trouble is he made a, a Bayesian argument in the 30s, and that was destined for failure. He suggests that we could do a heuristic sort of Thompson sampling. Sort of. Uh, so, for instance, there's the ad predictor system from Microsoft. And in there, they encoded confidence in different parameters based on the number of measurements that had been applied to that. There's also the Adagrad optimization, where the learning rate is proportional to the sum of the squares of updates to that already. Both of those in indicate... Uh, a, a similar heuristic to what you suggest. So there's probably something like that that would work quite well, but otherwise I couldn't say. Uh, you know, s smells right is all I can say. Did you want to ask a You still want to ask a question, even after I abuse you. <laughs> Many recommendation engines are uh, what we in the business call uh, broken. It's a technical <laughs> term. Uh, it's a sad thing, but true. And uh, we borrowed the term from science, uh, where they refer to the equipment as broken. But uh, this is very common. And there are some structural reasons for that and some other reasons. It's often true that the political climate within a company will force a certain kind of solution which may make somebody happy, but it may not make the customers happy. You sound like an unhappy customer. Now, the other thing that happens, though, which is much harder to fix, is that the space of things to recommend may be actually relatively small. And this is one of the big arguments to not allow users to do Boolean constraints on a recommender, because it's very easy for them to collapse down to a set of acceptable units that are too small and reject things that were incorrectly tagged that they would love. But the fact is, there's not more than 100,000 movies, and there certainly aren't more than 100,000 worth watching. And so it can becomes very difficult to recommend new content when there may not be any good new content for you. Uh, I mean, and then there's Sturgeon's Law, which is... This was a famous science fiction author. He was once asked, why is 90% of science fiction just crap? And he answered, 90% of everything is crap. So it's not unusual. But that's true in video as well. So that cuts the number of things worth recommending to a relatively small number. And they may have just started scraping the bottom of the barrel. That that's a common problem in video. Well, uh, commercial video as opposed to user-generated content when there's an infinite amount of that. Not an infinite amount of good stuff, but infinite amount of it. But anyway, so you, uh, it may be that they can't fix it, but it may also be that they have gone the wrong direction. I, at least a different direction than I would go, therefore the wrong direction. Uh, but the, yeah, there's, there's bad recommenders out there in successful systems that 
it isn't a guarantee that that system will fail because they didn't do a good recommender. And they may have other constraints, like just reality. It may be too hard to do a good one. Or they may have other things that are more valuable to do. You're still a customer, right? Yeah, so maybe fixing the recommender is not such a valuable thing for them to do if they <laughs> still got you. Anybody else? We have 31 seconds. No prime number seconds questions. Well, we'll let you do a repeat. So, so the question is, how do you avoid overfitting? One second to go. Too bad. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, there's many ways to do that. First of all, that's only one person, if it's a hyperactive person. And so they only get one vote. And the, all of the co-occurrence is how many people had co-occurring items in their history. And so overfitting to one person's actions is not a problem. Overfitting in general to the training data you have is best handled, of course, by being successful and getting lots of data. Uh, but it is also helped by the random numbers because they churn it up a bit, and they, they, they spread it out from this local optimum, and then you, you, you gather better data. And even if you overfit in one case, if that causes you to collect data that directly contradicts the overfitting, it's not so bad because it only lasts for a day or two, and then you give very specific, don't do that, evidence back to the model. And so you can learn very quickly by these techniques and escape those, those situations. Okay, well thank you, this is a great session. And largely great because there were good questions. Thank you, thank you very much.